Brasilaz, Prince of Abyssinia. Chapter 1. Description of a Palace in a Valley. Ye who listen with credulity to the whispers of fancy, and pursue with eagerness the phantoms of hope, who expect that age will perform the promises of youth, and that the deficiencies of the present day will be supplied by the morrow, attend to the history of Rasselas, Prince of Abyssinia. Rasselas was the fourth son of the mighty emperor in whose dominions the father of waters begins his course, whose bounty pours down the streams of plenty and scatters over the world of the harvests of Egypt. According to the custom which has descended from age to age among the monarchs of the Torrid Zone, Rasselas was confined in a private palace with the other sons and daughters of Abysnian royalty till the order of succession should call him to the throne. The place which the wisdom of policy of antiquity had destined for the residence of the Abyssinian princes was a spacious valley in the kingdom of Amahara, surrounded on every side by mountains, of which the summits overhang the middle part. The only passage by which it could be entered was a cavern that passed under a rock, of which it has long been disputed whether it was the work of nature or of human industry. The outlet of the cavern was concealed by a thick wood and the mouth which opened the valley was closed with the gates of iron forged by the artificers of ancient days so massy that no man without the help of engines could open or shut them. From the mountains, on every side, rivulets descended that filled all the valley with the verdure and fertility and formed a lake in the middle inhabited by every species of fish and frequented by every fowl whom nature has taught to dip wing in water. This lake discharged its superfluities by a stream which entered a dark cleft in the mountain on the northern side and fell with dreadful noise from the precipice to precipice till it was heard no more. The sides of the mountain were covered with trees. The banks of the brooks were diversified with flowers. Every blast shook spices from the rocks and every month dropped fruits upon the ground. All animals that bite the grass or browse the shrub, whether wild or tame, wandered in this extensive circuit, secured from beasts of prey by the mountains which confined them. On one part were flocks and herds feeding in the pastures, on another all the beasts of chase frisking in the lawns. The sprightly kid was bounding on the rocks, the subtle monkey frolicking in the trees, and the solemn elephant reposing in the shade. All the diversities of the world were brought together, the blessings of nature were collected, and its evils extracted and excluded. The valley, wide and fruitful, supplied its inhabitants with all the necessaries of life, and all delights and superfluities were added at the annual visit which the emperor paid his children, when the iron gate was opened to the sound of music, and during eight days every one that resided in the valley was required to propose whatever might contribute to make the seclusion pleasant, to fill up the vacancies of attention, and to lessen the tediousness of time. Every desire was immediately granted. All the artificers of pleasure were called to the guard, clad in the festivities. The musicians exerted the power of harmony, and the dancers showed their activity before the princes in hope that they should pass their lives in this blissful captivity, to which those only were admitted whose performance was thought able to add novelty to luxury. Such was the appearance of security and delight which this retirement afforded, that they to whom it was new always desired that it might be perpetual, and as those on whom the iron gate had once closed were never suffered to return, the effect of longer experience could not be known. Thus every year produced new schemes of delight and new competitors for imprisonment. The palace stood on an eminence raised about thirty paces above the surface of the lake. It was divided into many squares or courts, built with greater or less magnificence according to the rank for, of those for whom they were designed. The roofs were turned into arches of massive stone joined by a cement that grew harder by time, and the buildings stood from century to century deriding the sol sol solsteel rains and the equinoctial hurricanes without need of reparation. This house, which was so large as to be fully known to none but some ancient officers who successively inherited the secrets of the palace, was built as if suspicion herself had dictated the plan. To every room there was an open and secret passage. Every square had a communication with the rest, either from upper stories or by private galleries, 
or by subterranean passages from the lower apartments. Many of the columns had unsuspected cavities in which a long race of monarchs had reposed their treasures. They then closed up the opening with marble, which was never to be removed but in the utmost exigencies of the kingdom, and recorded their accumulations in a book, which was itself concealed in a tower, not entered but by the emperor, attended by the prince who stood next in succession. Chapter 2. The Discontent of Rasselas in the Happy Valley Here the sons and daughters of Abysnia lived only to know the soft vicissitudes of pleasure and repose. Attended by all that were skillful to delight, and gratified with whatever senses can enjoy, they wandered gardens of fragrance and slept in a fortress of security. Every art was practiced to make them pleased with their own condition. The sages who instructed them told them nothing but of the miseries of public life, and, all, and described all beyond the mountains as regions of calamity, where discord was always ranging, and where man preyed upon man. To heighten their opinion of their own felicity, they were daily entertained with songs, the subject of which was the Happy Valley. Their appetites were excited by frequent enumerations of different enjoyments, and revelry and merriment were the business of every hour, from the dawn of morning to the close of even. These methods were generally successful. Few of the princes had ever wished to enlarge their bounds, but passed their lives in full conviction that all within their reach that art all within their reach that art or nature could bestow, and had pitied those whom fate had excluded from this seat of tranquillity as the sport of chance and the slaves of misery. Thus they rose in the morning and lay down at night, pleased with each other and with themselves, all but Rasselas, who, in the twenty sixth year of his age, began to withdraw from their pastimes and assemblies and to delight in solitary walks and silent meditation. He often sat before tables covered in luxury and forgot to taste the dainties that were placed before him. He rose abruptly in the midst of song and hastily retired beyond the sound of music. His attendants observed this change and endeavored to renew his love of pleasure. They neglected their officiousness, repulsed, he neglected their officiousness, repulsed their invitations, and spent day after day on the banks of rivulets sheltered with trees, where he sometimes listened to the birds in the branches, sometimes observed the fish playing in the stream, and anon cast his eyes along upon the pastures and mountains filled with animals, of which some were biting the herbage, and some sleeping among the bushes. The singularity of his humor made him much observed. One of the sages, in whose conversation he had formerly delighted, followed him secretly in hope of discovering the cause of his disquiet. Rasselas, who knew not that anyone was near him, having for some time fixed his eyes upon the goats that were browsing among the rocks, began to compare their condition with his own. What, said he, makes the difference between man and all the rest of the animal creation? Every beast that strays beside me has the same corporal necessities with myself. He is hungry, and the crops the grass. He is thirsty and drinks the stream. His thirst and hunger are appeased. He is satisfied and sleeps. He rises again and is hungry, and he is again fed and is at rest. I am hungry and thirsty like him, but when thirst and hunger cease, I am not at rest. I am, like him, pained with want, but am not, like him, satisfied with fullness. The intermediate hours are tedious and gloomy. I long again to be hungry that I might quicken my attention. The birds peck the berries or the corn and fly away to the groves where they sit in seeming happiness on the branches and waste their lives in tuning one unvaried series of sounds. I likewise can call the lutenist and the singer, but the sounds that pleased me yesterday weary me today and will grow yet more wearisome tomorrow. I can discover within me no power of perception which is not glutted with its proper pleasure yet I do not feel myself delighted. Man has surely some latent sense for which this place affords no gratification, or he has some desire distinct from sense which must be satisfied before he can be happy. After this he lifted up his head, and seeing the moon rising, walked toward the palace. As he passed through the fields and saw the animals around him, ye, said he, are happy, and need not envy me that walk thus among you, burdened with myself. Nor do I, ye gentle beings, envy your felicity, for it is not the felicity of man. 
I have many distresses from which ye are free. I fear pain when I do not feel it. I sometimes shrink at evils recollected, and sometimes start at evils anticipated. Surely the equity of providence has balanced peculiar sufferings with peculiar enjoyments. With observations like these, the prince amused himself as he returned, uttering them with a plaintive voice, yet with a look that discovered him to feel some complacence in his own perspicacity, and to receive some solace of the miseries of life, from consciousness of the de delicacy with which he felt, and the eloquence with which he bewailed them. He mingled cheerfully in the diversions of the evening, and all rejoiced to find that his heart was lightened. Chapter 3. The Want of Him That Wants Nothing on this next day, his old instructor, imagining that he had now made himself acquainted with his disease of mind, was in hope of curing it by counsel, and officiously sought an opportunity of conference, which the prince, having long considered him as one whose intellects were exhausted, was not very willing to afford. Why, said he, does this man thus intrude upon me? Shall I never be suffered to forget those lectures which pleased me only while they were new? and to become new again must be forgotten. Then he walked into the woods and composed himself to his usual meditations, when, before his thoughts had taken any settled form, he perceived his pursuer at his side, and was at first prompted by his impatience to go away hastily, but being unwilling to offend a man whom he had once reverenced and still loved, he invited him to sit down with him on the bank. The old man, thus encouraged, began to lament the change which had lately been observed in the prince, and to inquire why he so often retired from the pleasures of the palace to loneliness and silence. I fly from pleasure, said the prince, because pleasure has ceased to please. I am lonely because I am miserable, and I am unwilling to cloud with my presence the happiness of others. You see, you, sir, said the sage, are the first who has complained of misery in the happy valley. I hope to convince you that your complaints have no real cause. You are here in full possession of all the emperor of Abyssinia can bestow. Here is neither labor to be endured, nor danger to be dreaded. Yet here is all that labor or danger can procure or purchase. Look round and tell me which of your wants is without supply. If you want nothing, how are you unhappy? That I want nothing, said the prince, or that I know not what I want, is the cause of my complaint. If I had any known one, I should have a certain wish that would excite endeavor, and I should not then repine to see the sun move so slowly towards the western mountain, or lament when the day breaks, and sleep will no longer hide me from myself. When I see the kids and the lambs chasing one another, I fancy that I should be happy if I had something to pursue. But, possessing all that I can want, I find one day and one hour exactly like another, except the later is still more tedious than the former. Let your experience inform me how day may now seem as short as in my childhood, while nature was yet fresh, and every moment showed me what I had never observed before. I have already enjoyed too much. Give me something to desire. The old man was surprised at this new species of affliction, and knew not what to reply, yet was unwilling to be silent. Sir, said he, if you had seen the miseries of the world, you would know how to value your present state. Now, said the prince, you have given me something to desire. I shall long to see the miseries of the world, since the sight of them is necessary to happiness. Chapter 4. The Prince Continues to Grieve and Muse At this time the sound of music proclaimed the hour of repast, and the conversation was concluded. The old man went away sufficiently discontented to find that his reasonings had produced only the, the only conclusion which they were intended to prevent. But in the decline of life, shame and grief are of short duration, whether it be that we bear easily what we have borne long, or that, finding ourselves in age less regarded, we less regard others, or that we look with slight regard upon afflictions to which we know that the hand of death is about to put an end. The prince whose views were extended to a wider space, could not speedily quiet his emotions. He had been before terrified at the length of life which nature promised him, because he considered that in a long time much must be abjured. He now rejoiced in his youth, because in many years much, much might be done. 
The first beam of hope that had ever been darted into his mind rekindled youth in his cheeks and doubled the luster of his eyes. He was fired with the desire of doing something, though he knew not yet, with distinctness, either end or means. He was now no longer gloomy and unsocial, but considered himself as a master of a secret stock of happiness, which he could enjoy only by concealing it. He affected to be busy in all schemes of diversion, and endeavored to make others pleased with the state of which he himself was wary. But pleasures can never be so multiplied or continued as not to leave much of life unemployed. There were many hours, both of night and day, which he could spend without suspicion in solitary thought. The load of life was much lightened. He went eagerly into the assemblies because he supposed the frequency of his presence necessary to the success of his purposes. He retired gladly to privacy because he now had a subject of thought. His chief amusement was to picture to himself the world which he had never seen, to place himself in various conditions, to be entangled in imaginary difficulties, and to be engaged in wild adventures. But his benevolence always terminated his projects in the relief of distress, the detection of fraud, the defeat of opposition, and the diffusion of happiness. Thus passed twenty months of the life of Rasselas. He busied himself so intensively in visionary bustle that he forgot his real solitude, and amidst hourly preparations for the various incidents of human affairs, neglected to consider by what means he should mingle with mankind. One day, as he was sitting on a bank, he feigned to himself an orphan virgin robbed of her little portion by a treacherous lover, and crying after him for restitution and redress. So strongly was the image impressed upon his mind that he started up in the maid's defense and ran forward to seize the plunderer with all eagerness of real pursuit. Fear naturally quickens the flight of guilt. Rasselas could not catch the fugitive with his utmost efforts, but resolving to weary by perseverance him who he could not surpass in speed, he pressed on foot till the foot of the mountain stopped his course. Here he recollected himself, and smiled at his own useless impetuosity, then raising his eyes to the mountain. This, said he, is the fatal obstacle that hinders at once the enjoyment of pleasure and the exercise of virtue. How long is it that my hopes and wishes have flown beyond this boundary of my life, which yet I never have attempted to surmount? Struck with this reflection, he sat down to muse, and remembered that since he first resolved to escape from his confinement, the sun had passed twice over him in its annual course. Now he felt a degree of regret with which he had never before been acquainted. He considered how much might have been done in the time which had passed, and left nothing real behind it. He compared twenty months with the life of a man. In life, said he, it is not to be counted the ignorance of infancy or the imbecility of age. We are long before we are able to think, and we soon cease from the power of acting. The true period of human existence may be reasonably estimated at forty years, of which I have mused away the four and twentieth part. What I have lost was certain, for I have certainly possessed it. But of twenty months to come, who can assure me? The consciousness of his own folly pierced him deeply, and he was long before he could be reconciled to himself. The rest of my time, said he, has been lost by the crime of folly of my ancestors and of the absurd institutions of my country. I remember it with disgust, yet without remorse. But the months that have passed since new light darted into my soul, since I formed a scheme of reasonable felicity, have I been squandered by my own fault. I have lost that which cannot be restored. I have seen the sun rise and set for twenty months, and I gaze er, on the light of heaven. In this time the birds have left the nest of their mother and committed themselves to the woods and to the skies. The kid has forsaken the teat and learned by degrees to climb the rocks in quest of independent sustenance. I only have made no advances, but am still helpless and ignorant. The moon, by more than twenty changes, admonished me of the flux of life. The stream that rolled before my feet abraded my inactivity. I sat feasting on intellectual luxury, regardless alike of the examples of the earth and the instructions of the planets. Twenty months are past. Who shall restore them? 
These sorrowful meditations fastened upon his mind. He passed four months in resolving to lose no more time in idle resolve, and was awakened to more vigorous exertion by hearing a maid, who had broken a porcelain cup, remark that what cannot be repaired is not to be regretted. This was obvious, and Rasselas reproached himself that he had not discovered it, having not known, or not considered, how many useful hints are obtained by chance, and how often the mind, hurried by her own ardor to distant views, neglects the truth that lie open before her. For a few hours he regretted his regret, and from that time bent his whole mind upon the means of escaping from the valley of happiness.